Welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and I'm here with Tom Roberts from Riff Raff. Hello. And this week, we don't have any announcements yet about the Best Translated Book Award shortlist, which will come out uh, next Tuesday, April 18th. Um, but we are going to just talk about a few general topics, a couple, couple things that are just kind of going to push together, more or less. Right. Uh, yes, things that are simmering in in the publishing world, in the writing world, the artistic world, um, and sort of the culture at large. So I will let you sort of introduce a, our Trojan horse here, if you'd like. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, well, first, do you have any new news about about Riff Raff or still holding pattern? Holding pattern. It's largely a um, result of the. Um, how do I put this politely without? fear of offending somebody who might possibly be listening to this, although it seems highly unlikely. Um, the wheels of, of lawmaking move very, very slowly uh, and are subject to a lot of wins from a lot of very different uh, factors and few of which we have any actual influence over. Oh, man. <laughs> You're listening to Crime Town. Yeah. It's not that bad. Let me just say that it's nowhere near <laughs> that bad anymore. <laughs> the messages of what all that you know was at one point are still, and I've said this before, they're still there. Like the the mechanism to be corrupt still exists. I can uh, totally believe that. Yeah. So it's it's frustrating. We're not at like tearing our hair out point quite yet because. We the, the end is still within sight, and, and you know, um, there's no reason to believe it won't happen. It's just we're operating on someone else's time frame, yeah. And cannot get that person who we don't even know to change their minds, and are sort of rallying the troops to get that person to you know do something a little more quickly for us and do us a favor. But God knows if that'll happen. Yeah, oh, boy. Yeah, can only imagine. But in the meantime, you guys get to like work on. Some stuff, I assume. Yes, we do. We do other things. Um, we're in the middle of training on our software. Like on a, you know, once a week we have these sessions with the um, the people who made the software and for for the inventory. What kind, uh, what, what program is it? We're going with Basil. Oh, okay. Which, um, I guess sort of subsequent to the conversation we were having before we actually started recording, uh, is a internet based. I mean, there's a program you download to your computer, but the, your data lives on the internet as opposed to being backed up onto a hard drive every night or something like that, which uh, all the other programs run on. It also means that you get frequent updates that they can, um, you know, your, your software won't go out of date anytime. If there's a bug, they can fix it, you know, relatively quickly. Um, that sort of thing. It also, it just frees up your computer to do things you know, more efficiently, I suppose. Um, it's also a software that was created much more recently than any of the other bookstore soft inventory softwares that exist out there. Right. Um, meaning it doesn't have all these holdover sort of weird uh, quirks, I suppose is the right way to uh, describe them from programs that were invented when they were all running on DOS. Um, yeah. And of course changed over to operating on windows, but you look at them and you're like, oh, God, what? This is clearly a very old software. So this is new, um, doesn't have any of that sort of stuff. And uh, for that reason, we, we decided to go with it. You'll get mixed. Any, if you ask any bookseller across the country what software they like, which ones they endorse, you will get. Um, I mean, there's like four companies, basically. You will get four different answers. Um, I just sort of test drove all of them and um, talked to people, and this is the one that I liked the best. They're also, you know, there these. This guy invented the, created the software uh, because his wife owns a used bookstore in, I'm gonna say near Columbus, Georgia, like some small town in Georgia. Okay. Um, and she was struggling with software, you know, inventory sort of thing for a used store. And he's clearly a computer guy and made her the software and did so well with it. She must have told people at a meeting and blah, blah, blah. You know, several years later, he's now selling it to other bookstores and you can customize it to used or new or all that sort of stuff. So it's a real feel good sort of startup 
businessy kind of thing. Yeah, it doesn't so, seem super expensive compared to other things. Yeah, it's it's another one of these things where you pay monthly, um, and it's whether or not you want to shell out a large chunk of money when you open the store and then do so again when you feel like you need an upgrade or something like that um, when it gets too buggy several years from now and then shell out that money again or do you want to put it on the books and know how much it's going to cost you every month for the foreseeable future and you know that's we made one decision i totally understand the other decision as well though yeah the, the one that we used at um down at quill ridge and raleigh was word stock which yep. <laughs> which i remember very very pointedly that at that point in time you had to get um cds that you had to upload the new inventory, like the new Ingram catalog, into the system via CD that was mailed to you on a monthly basis. Yes. That sadly happened. I mean, that by the time I started working in bookstores in 2005, that had finally, finally disappeared. I would hope so. But it did take a while. Yeah, because um, this was 99. So it's not, <laughs> it's not that and long Wordstock, ago. Wordstock did run on DOS until like 2007 or 8. So Right. So crazy. Um, yes. It's curious. I mean, I know it's all insider baseball stuff, but I'm always interested in like those kind of, those kind of parts of the bookstore experience, like how you, how this works and like why this is important and what it can do for you and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, if I'm happy to talk about this stuff with anybody who asks, um, and I asked everybody at winter Institute this year and was in New York not long after and, asked several people at bookstores in new york what they used and like i said you get a ton of different answers but in those answers you'll get certain explanations about what people like and dislike about things um and what some people dislike i might like you know that thing so it's you know anyway anyway okay so the thing that we were going to talk about they were initially going to talk about was that there had been Recently, and I saw this like blow up on on Twitter from various people that Condé Nast had changed their their contract for freelancers, and that freelancers who wanted to get paid essentially uh, quicker, or which quicker uh, the way that it was talked about on Twitter made it sound like on time from what they were asking for, that they would have to pay a percentage to Condé Nast, that they'd get their money, but they'd get less of it um, if they wanted to be paid on time, and everyone flipped out. It went crazy, and I thought that this would be a good way of talking about the way that freelancing impacts publishing, and especially in relation to translators, and how how to nag to get your money, is there anyone to support them, all that kind of stuff. But there's a caveat to this, is that I just read a story right before we started this podcast that the, the change to the freelancer contract isn't intended, they're updating it because it was never intended to be for individual freelancers, but for companies such as Staples or FedEx, that they could get their money faster by losing a percentage, and that totally makes sense. Um, so counting us maybe isn't completely evil, um, but I feel like there's been a number of stories about freelancers and freelancer problems recently with these kind of bigger corporations. There's one from August that's about Vice and how Vice had huge problems with their freelancers um, and are trying to take steps to update and fix that. Um, so it's not like this is like everything's hunky dory just because they didn't mean to include individuals in there. But nevertheless, like the main basis for our story is kind of uh, or for our discussion is kind of gone. But nevertheless, there are all all translators are generally treated as freelancers, and this can become a problem, or, or it sort of changes the way things work. It does. Um, I mean, it, it's more than to, to to get this clear from the beginning. It's more than just translators. In that, for a, the, this is mainly for small publishers. Um, but what that what I'm about to say, because at Penguin they have their whole in house staff of copy editors, fact checkers. Um, layout uh, people, uh, production people, designers, although individual book cover designs will get freelanced out if uh, if the art director feels that there's an artist in particular that they need to use or whatever, they have the, the authority to go out and hire that person. Um, but everything is including lawyers. Like Penguin has their own legal department. These two you know, uh, lawyers who sit in this corner office on, on a random floor and go over every contract that goes through those doors. So that's, they're all paid salaries, you know, um, benefits, benefits, uh, 
presumably there's, you know, um, opportunities for advancement, you know, they're limited. They could, they could 10 years down the road become, you know, head freelance, you know, head uh, copy editor. They can be in charge of that department or whatever. It's not, you know, the most uh, glamorous part of the publishing world, but it's incredibly essential. And at a place like New Directions, for example, there are nine permanent staff members and you know four of those are basically editors two of them do sort of like really truly behind the scenes kind of uh contracts and bookkeeping sort of things um well you know new directions has a lot of um right sub rights sort of things with you know poems going into anthologies and that sort of thing you've got one production guy you've got two publicity people and that's your staff. You'll notice that I did not mention designers. We have a production, we had a production guy, but not designers. So all of that was freelanced out. You know, even if Paul Zaire was doing, you know, half of all New Directions covers, he was still freelance. You know, they are not paying him uh, a salary and they're not paying him and not giving him any benefits or anything like that. And they could literally say no more Paul Zaire next week and there'd be no consequences. Also, um, all of the copy editing was done by freelancers. Um, oh, and I didn't I, realize that. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always a round that's done in-house. Um, and depending on the book, I will say, like, it, it's, it can be done in-house, the, the final copy editing. Um, but some, for, for truly, like, complex sort of long things, there's a, there are a few copy editors that they use. And these people would come by the office and drop off their, you know, the manuscripts that they had written their notes on and they would get paid, a, you know, at the end of the month. Um, and that's the point is like those people are necessary for every publishing house. I'm sure. I don't know if you guys use uh, outside copy editors. Nope. Do you? Nope. Wow, you do it all yourself. See, that's a lot of work. Oh yeah. That's what, yeah. I, I, when you say nine people, it's like, Jesus, I can't imagine what would be able to do with nine people. Um, well, they do 35 books a year. So yeah. I mean, that's, that's, three times, three and a half times as many books as we have, um, for three times the employees. So that seems about, about right. Um, the, yeah, we do, we do it, but we use interns too. So some of the, some of the, like the proofreading is done by interns, but copy editing is done in house. Um, and everything's basically done in house and we have no, no budget for anything outside of that. (laughs) We, we barely, we barely exist as it. So that, so, yeah, so we don't have as many of that, but we do use, obviously, freelance translators. Right. And translators are the big, the other big part of this, um, who are much like, you know, the same way that a, um, a foreign publisher is given uh, money, the advance money, for the rights to publish a, a book in English, and they get a contract, um, and, you know, when the money is due and all that sort of thing, translator gets the same. And I don't know if many people know this, but translators generally sign a contract for a book that has been acquired. Sometimes it's all done at the same time, meaning that it's done in coordination with the foreign publisher or with the author themselves or whatever. But shortly after the book is signed, the translator signs the contract. It's almost, you know, you want to get started right away. Um, That translator signs a contract and within that contract is generally outlined a payment schedule. Most respectable sort of (laughs) publishers will give either half or one third, depending on their sort of in-house model of the total amount, which is done generally based on a, on a per word or, you know, a large fee sort of estimate. Um, One third on signing one third on delivery, meaning when the first draft of the translation is accepted by the publisher and then one third when the book goes on sale, you know, a year later. So let's say you get, just to make it easy, a $9,000 to publish, to translate a manuscript that is about, I don't know, let's say 75,000 words. That sounds, I'm not going to do the math on that, but that's probably a reasonable contract for a book that length. Um, so you get $3,000 when you sign a contract, you get $3,000 when you hand in a manuscript you know, however many months that takes you, depending on your workload. And then you get 3000 afterwards. Very rarely, in my experience, uh, 
mind you, I've never written the checks for New Direction, so I cannot speak to how quickly they pay translators at all. And I'm not going to. You can speak to how quickly you pay yours. Very rarely, with all the translators I know, and of course, Emma being one, and me as, as well, um, which I don't know if anyone knows about, but... Um, <laughs> Spilling secrets now. Well, no, it's, I don't right, know if no, it's public no. information, but we have a signed contract, so... Yeah. Um, no one ever pays you, you... No one ever gives you a check faster than you would, you would expect it. It never, arrives, <laughs> it never arrives early. Let's just put it that way. And very rarely does it arrive without you having to nudge the editor or whoever uh, that you've been in contact with to say, hey, I signed a contract a month ago. What the hell's going on? Yeah. Where's my Every single time. Every translator, I'm sure, listening to this can attest to this. And sometimes it takes three months to get your initial deli- like on-signing check. Yep. Many of many of the translators will, of course, have already been, begun the work. Which yeah. is, you know, that's how much faith do you have in the publisher to not totally renege on their deal. But it could happen, right? You could totally be going along thinking they're going to publish this book. And, OK, they're just sorting out their paperwork. And, OK, you know, they only send out checks at the end of the month. But we signed the contract on the third of the month. I'm not going to wait five weeks to get started when I have time right now and no other work, you're going to start the work, right? Yeah. Maybe you don't do one third of it or whatever, but you've started the work. And then if the you know rug gets pulled out from underneath you and all of a sudden the publisher says, okay, you know, we have a new publisher who just took over and they're changing the list and they've decided not to publish the, the book that we had offered you a contract on, et cetera, et cetera. Or they want to go with a new translator or something. God knows what, it could totally happen, and you would be out. That, that there is that story that's on the three percent website of uh, Jonathan Wright, who is translating Al Al Swani's uh, Automobile Club of Egypt, where he had an agreement, had been working, had basically, I believe, finished the translation, and then Knopf was like, "Nope, we're using a different translator because of all these problems," and they withdrew the whole offer from him. They didn't give him anything. I, in the end, oh. th- so at the time that we ran the article, no. But then afterwards, he emailed me and said that they reached some sort of agreement and he got something, but not, he was not fully compensated. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a horrible thing to do to somebody. That story is crazy, though. That's, a, that's an outlier, I hope. Right, but it, it does happen. And yeah. worse, okay, that's, that's worst case scenario. What happens more often is that translators have to nudge and nudge and nudge and nudge to try to get payments. And it becomes, one, obviously very frustrating for the translator who needs that money. Um, But two, it becomes this sort of fraught relationship where you're, you're dependent on this person for this money. And so you you would, on the one hand, want to nudge them, but on the other hand, don't want to sort of insult them or get into sort of some sort of confrontation because it feels like you run the risk of pissing them off and that they can just never pay you or pay you at their own pace or anything, something like that. And so it becomes a situation where clearly the publisher has all the power. And that's not a good situation. Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, I, and there is like, there's there's things that get into with this too in terms of why that that structure has happened. Um, although before and I should say that too, like even for the articles I've written for magazines, that same thing happens. There's there's a running joke with one. I don't even want to name it because it's not worth it. But the one of the editors, it's, it's almost it's become a running joke where every time that I send in the invoice, it takes like months, and I always have to remind him. And then he's like have you ever gotten that check? And it's like, it can be like four months. And like the, the last time I wrote something, he's like, well, hopefully you'll get this before the end of the year. So it's not, it's not just the small presses. This is a big place, but, um, but nevertheless with small presses, there is that there's like, not only are the translators beholden to them, but there's the problem that most small presses are like running where one fuck up can end them. Um, there, there two fuck ups can end them. And like, if they, they're, they're, backup for where the money's coming from might not exist. Like a lot of places are basically as publishing works where you're selling books today 
um, that are paying for things that are either going to come out or you're getting grants that are going to pay things that you owe for um, in hopes, everything's aspirational in hopes that at some point you will have, you will get ahead. But generally you're like right on that, that cusp of trying to sell enough books to offset the returns that are coming in, to be able to pay for the bills that are coming in and everything's like this constant cycle. And for, since most of these presses that are doing translations tend to be very small presses or like small enough that like they're, they literally don't have anything in the bank um, or any significant amount of money in the bank for, for things like this. Um, when something goes wrong, they can, they can go, they can go tragically wrong and they can just not have the money there. Um, so translators are in a tough situation where you have to, you have to work with these places cause they're the ones providing the work. Um, but at the same time, they're the ones that are the least capable of being able to pay you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really awkward situation and, and made worse, I think, by the fact that there are so few employees at these places that you're always going to be not only, you know, working with them on this book and meaning your your edits are all going to come from this person. You know, your point of contact is this person who also owes you money. Right. Yeah. At I will say this, like when I worked at Penguin, it was very easy to say, oh, God, the contracts department, God knows what they're doing. Let me harass them again. You know, like, <laughs> right. it, was just, like it was their fault, but it was also like convenient for me to throw them under the bus. Like, oh, yeah. Because they deserved it. But do you know what I mean? So there's like this buffer between me and like the actual guilty party, you know, and that made the, the working editorial relationship you know, as stress-free as possible in terms of payment, right? And that's, I mean, that's the job of an agent. That's true. Um, you know, the agent is the guy who calls and says, where's the contract, where's the contract, where's the contract, where's the contract, where's the check, where's the check? And that spares the, the writer from having to do that, um, which I'm sure many writers are very grateful for. And to a certain extent, I'm sure a lot of editors at major publishers or even small publishers are grateful for because who wants to have an author on in, in their ear every day on the phone saying, where's my check? You know, at least a, an agent sort of can fend off the, the angry author and sort of present everything in a, in a nice calm manner, which yeah. is not saying there are crazy agents out there as well, but generally, you know, they're, uh, they're not the, they understand the situation and, and can be um, more reasonable about the whole thing. Right. And they don't care if the, you know, they're paying the same amount of money for the book. So they don't care if the agent is skimming off the top to, to do that work. Um, which reminds me of these translators uh, agencies. Yeah. So what's your, what's, so there's a couple of them now and they, so they, and both these, one of them is called uh, something and some, the other one's called something else. Um, one of them is Starling called- cause I know it's a bird. Right. And the other one is... Sadia. Sadia. That's right. Sadia. Sorry, everyone who I certain that <laughs> some of these people are listening to us. And uh, that was unintentional, but I really just couldn't remember. Um, but these are new agencies. Oh, agencies is a tricky word. They're translator collectives is how I think they're both described in which there are members, founding members who are a number of translators from a number of different languages who are working together to promote each other's work. And I assume they're offering services to, tr- to publishers, which we can get into in a second. Um, but they are like a source for all these projects. So instead of just like talking to person A about Spanish books because they translate Spanish, Sidi and Company represents projects from like nine different languages. And then theoretically, they can um, be serve as that agent that they can they can jointly try and get the money from the publishers that owe them. Right. Or I don't know how that would work, though, to be honest. I don't know how it would work either, um, but to me, if I were a translator interested in in something along these lines, I think it would be more for the um, the idea that you you have a like a union almost. I mean, you don't have anything binding, but it, you know you have a collective of people who are who will stand by you um, to fight for your money and. I mean, this is making it seem really combative, and that's not really what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that it, it slowly pushes towards a norm in which people are paid on time, right? And that's what everyone wants. And if the existence of these agencies sort of makes it so that contracts are reviewed, so that everything is you know, in fine prints, you will be paid by this 
set time and, and et cetera, et cetera. If there was some way to sort of standardize payment schedules and make sure that they happen and more importantly, that there are consequences for not paying on time and that sort of thing. If that all existed and there were other people who stood by this and said, well, I'm not turning in my manuscripts until this person gets their you know, first check or their second check or whatever, maybe it would start to change things. Maybe people would just blackball the entire collective worth of translators. I don't know. But to me, that's what's interesting. I'm less, I'm very curious to know what an individual uh interaction would be like from a member of this collective with a, an editor at a translator a, a publisher that does translations like, we have a contract with one of the people that's part of sedia and company with heather cleary um and but, i don't know yeah nothing's happened with it yet we still owe her a contract so it's at that stage but you there's nothing um like, Sadia didn't have anything to do with you getting that book, did it? No, absolutely not. Like, we, we were interested in, uh, in the book. I mean, Heather submitted the sample to us. It's by, uh, since he signed the contract, this is, a, this is not, like, uh, super privy, but Sergio Shapex, Los Incompletos, she had sent the sample for it. Um, we wanted to do more books of his. We had been sort of dragging our feet for, for years, um, and we decided to do this one in particular with Heather and so he signed his contract, and now we have to send her a contract. Kaya does all of those, um, and I sign off on them or look at them. Um, but so far, none of the none of the conversations have involved Sadia directly. Just that she's a, the founding member, and I know that. Like, I'd be curious to know if, like, the next time you met Heather for whatever reason, drinks or whatever, in New York or something during Penn, let's say, if she pitched you a project from Jeffrey. Like right. For example, you know? I am I, too. Oh, I'm very curious to see how that would play out. Because I, I can see how that would be... I don't know if that would be helpful or confusing. I would think if I were you, I would think that would be confusing. I think that's... if you were not working for Open Letter and you were instead working for, I don't know, uh, FSG, who does a decent number of translations, but not a ton. There's always room for more. Maybe it would be helpful. Yeah, that's true. The, the thing that would make it more, more advantageous, which I don't think that they have anything to do with, is that the rights to the books that they're representing, if they had some control over that. Oh, no, I can't. They're, do you mean, are they like a rights clearing house or something? Right, which no. they're not. They're um, definitely but there can be so many problems with that where like say say for instance here's an example say they're they're promoting each other's books and uh how they're promotes to a, 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 a publisher a book that jeffrey's working on a project that jeffrey's working on this is a small publisher that doesn't know too much about translation and has only done a few books but she convinces them um that they should go for this one book and they do and they go to contact jeffrey jeffrey's like great i would love to translate this for you and then they try and get the rights and the the, tra- the author is like i don't want my book published by you you don't do translations you're small i'm not interested in that and the whole thing falls apart at that moment in time Right. Which I know of a very specific example in which this happened. Um, where, where a publisher was very interested and gone through like a lot of steps. And then the author was like, no, I just not. I don't want you to be my publisher. And we've had it happen, too. I mean, it definitely happens. Um, yeah, I don't know and what the what the workaround is for that. I don't think there is one. It's just, it's, it, it makes it a weird, complicated thing where you can get really invested in a book that might not actually be available for you. Right. Which is different for example, like if, if it were just Jeffrey, he was out there meeting editors, whatever, he probably would have talked to the author very specifically about what publishers he was going to talk to, what editors may be and get a blessing in order to proceed, right? Whereas if, and Jeffrey is privy to all that information and knows the game plan because it's his thing. And if, you know, one of the other six or seven people that are part of the collective for whatever reason decides, oh, here's an opening or here's somebody who might have some interest and decides to start pitching. And like you said, like, doesn't understand the intricacies of the the plan that Jeffrey and the author have perhaps laid out, then yeah, 
so I don't know how, how much time any one, how, how many, how much time and investment they could all have in all of each other's projects at the same time in order to be up to speed on all of these things, what you're talking about. It would be interesting. And we're sort of dragging it into this, but it would be interesting to have one of these people on here at some point to talk about what they see as the advantages of this sort of collective specifically and like how they're going to judge whether it's successful or not. Um, I, w- I would assume it would involve like getting more projects signed on. Um, the people who are part of Sadia, at least, are all pretty much like top notch and active. Is that like I know of basically all of them. There's one person I've, I've never met, but like everyone else I know, and they all seem to have various things going on. Um, and I wonder if like part of the benefit is this is simply the information sharing that they can set some sort of higher standards of payment, even though they can't really. Because it's still the publisher can make an offer and they can turn it down. But if the author, if the publisher has the rights to the book, then theoretically they can just say, well, we don't care. We'll work with a different translator then. Right. Um, so that, that negotiating power is a little bit strained. But then maybe, but there's still like some sort of information sharing, some sort of cooperative of getting more books pitched out there. But I still wonder like what they see as like, what is going to be the end benefit to this? They have a lot of people with a lot of knowledge. So some of the people on here include Sean Bai, who is, um, works with the Polish Cultural Institute, um, Julia Sanchez, who is an agent at Wiley, um, uh, to, to Elizabeth Jacquet, who is the new um, executive director of Alta. Uh, like these are all, and Alison Powell, who is still the co-chair of PEN America's Translation Committee. Like there are people that have a lot of connections and, and knowledge and information about the the industry. So putting all that knowledge into one place seems like a benefit, but I'm just, I would be curious just to hear like what their, what their sort of breakdown and, and reasoning is for it. Cause it reminds me a bit of a backwards and not quite the same um, thing as this uh, Spanish organization whose name I can't remember, but it was like made up of, of the first letters, the, the initials of all the translators who are part of it. And it was a cooperative to translate English books into Spanish. So it's working in a totally different way. But because there's such a huge amount of those books that get translated, especially like thrillers and whatever else that obviously a lot more books from English get translated into Spanish than vice versa, that they essentially served as the as like a translation um, service. So like the big publishers would work with them and be like, we're hiring you as a collective. You guys figure out who translates the books, do whatever. And in certain rush projects, like when there's like a political book that's coming out that has a very specific pub date, they would do it as a group so they could get it done faster and would like had like all these systems for interacting to be able to churn out massive translations of, of fiction and nonfiction, a huge numbers of them by working together. And that makes a lot of sense to me. But we don't that's not what this is at all. Um it's, it's kind of the opposite, but in the same way that they did, there was like a, for that one, there was like a very clear goal as like what your, your, what your result would be. Yeah. I wonder if, um, there's not another advantage from the other side of this equation for these translators, which is that two foreign publishers and foreign authors who are perhaps seeking uh, a little bit of exposure for their author or, you know, want to go to publishers with a, with a sample translation in hand. If they're looking, you know, say they wanted like their dream translator and the person is busy for seven years in the case of, you know, Margaret Joel Costa or something. Um, maybe the thinking behind this collective is that their visibility will help get them uh, more work from the other end in terms of um, projects that they can then, you know, champion or get attached to uh, in, in the early stages of, of pushing into the English market. That's true. That would, that would make sense, too. Because they do advertise um, a lot of, quote, publishing expertise, right, which would presumably to me mean that they understand the American translation market, which you do not need. But a lot of people do. But a French, a small French publisher might need. Yes. Right? Yes. So that's why I'm wondering if the, if, if the services aren't meant to be sort of on both sides of the equation. That's true. There's like readers reports and translate. Yeah, I could see that. That would make a lot of sense. Right. Because, yeah, exactly. 
the readers' reports, the sample translations, sort of getting themselves attached to projects earlier on, um, perhaps even encouraging more people to work a little harder, you know, to get something, direct them to the right place, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, sort of ushering, ushering projects across, you know. Yeah, and it is – there's a vantage too. Like one of their services is translation evaluating – evaluation and editing. Like if you needed something evaluated slash edited, it would make sense to go to a place like this to hire them as freelancers and then to maybe pay them at some point in the future <laughs> right. to tie this all back together. Right. Yeah. I mean that is the problem. And, and in case anyone is, you know, dismissive of this whole thing and – it is a very serious problem that freelancers in general all across the artistic world, and that's not just um, the publishing world, tend not to get paid on time. And it really, you know, it can ruin their lives. Um, no, one, no one wants to be the nag, you know, everyone wants to get paid on time. And yes, you have the flexibility of not having a full-time job that you have to report to every morning. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that you're, you're you also don't get health benefits, you know, like the trade offs shouldn't be that lopsided. Yeah. Um, I will say just to bring this back to like a, a different sort of realm of the economy in general, uh, simply because my family sort of uh, every one of my father's brothers uh, and the whole family basically are contractors. And it's the same thing. You know, you can go and put a new roof on somebody's house. And maybe you got a down payment for the materials and a little bit of, you know, um, per diem or for whatever you want to call it during the course of the, the how long it takes to do the job. But there's still like a ten thousand dollar check due when it's done. And you might have to go knock on that person's door and call that person for months before they'll pay you. And the only thing you can do is go to small claims court, you know, and what what the contractor you know, has a contract to do the work, much like a translator does, but doesn't the the homeowner still has all the power? Yeah, you know? I mean, this is you know what Donald Trump got called out for during the campaign for not paying his uh, contractors. You know, he has all the power in that scenario. And if there's one lesson we learned, that that's a okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can do anything you want. Uh, I have the opposite. When when we had our roof fixed um, years and years ago, we paid the contractor who never did it because they actually ended up in jail because they had been defrauding people throughout Rochester. So, yeah, um, that can also happen, but much more rarely, I think. And the, the one last little aspect I want to talk about with this, um, because I do think it matters, and I'm you know sort of a firm believer in this, is that. It, the devaluing of translators, the devaluing of freelancers in general, the idea that you can sort of pay them when you get around to it and that, you know, books need to be printed is more important and, and that sort of thing sort of spreads into how a publisher treats its other employees, its full-time employees, its interns and that sort of thing. It even goes, you know, it, it might affect the way interns are paid or not paid or given more than just, you know, $5 for lunch every day. Um, it, it sort of bleeds into how much an assistant at, you know, the low level editorial assistants or publicity assistants make, uh, in terms of salary and how long it might take them to move up a, a rung on the ladder and that sort of thing. And I feel like we have very little that we can control in the grand scheme of, of, you know, the, the larger econ economy and how fairly everyone, um, is treated within it. But this is a way where we can you know, make it work and we should be taking care of each other and not screwing each other over, or at least, um, you know, screwing each other over by, by, by accident, by not paying them on time, that sort of thing. Yeah. That's my sense. Damn it. <laughs> Fair enough. So everyone should get paid. Yes. Pay and there should just be more money in general given to these things. Cause that is part of this too, is that like, when you think about magazines in particular, like they're, they have fallen far. People don't buy magazines anymore. You know, right. the, the revenue generation is, is, you know, circumspect or hard to, hard to figure out. Um, advertising isn't going to last forever in the way that it, advertising money is. Um, so everything's a bit tricky. 
trying to figure right. out how to make that work is tricky. Right. Um, but the same thing goes for books. And this is the, the big reason we should all be fighting Amazon, um, not necessarily as an online bookstore, but because of their ridiculous price gouging, um, price slashing, I should say, where every book is automatically discounted simply by buying it at Amazon. And it devalues the book, the art itself, um, which is a problem because people should value the things that they buy. Um, there's no reason that you should expect a, you know, a brilliant Pulitzer prize winning book to be $5. You know, that's just, that's ridiculous. But Amazon is getting there. They're encouraging people to think that it's only worth that much. I, there's, there's a flip side of that though, too, of like the prices on books are semi artificial and that if there were more sales overall, they could be priced lower. Um, and where, and where the prices are, um, is somewhat set by Amazon because you know they're going to be discounted. You're still getting your 50, 48% or whatever it might be from Amazon. So you can put the price higher. You can say a book is $40 um, because they'll sell it for 20 which people are willing to pay for, and you will get 16 as a publisher. So the amount that's coming back to the publishers in a grand way is maybe higher by having these weird the, the, the discounted part of it because you can set your higher price higher or your first list price higher. And those, right. those sales they're, are going through Amazon and not through bookstores. Right. Well, that's the problem is that it hurts small bookstores because we can't afford to discount nearly as heavily as um, I am 100% Amazon. certain I've said this before on this podcast, but the students in my class, their idea of what, a, what the price of a book is is the amount that's listed on the Amazon page. It has nothing to do with what's printed on the book at all. So when they go into a bookstore, what do they think? They uh, that that they tend to they tend to a not go into bookstores. The people I have in my class this time, there's like they had not they had not been in a single independent store with any regularity. There was a half price books and um, a used bookstore, so not a new bookstore, new independent bookstore at all. Um, but they there have been people that just assume that that price is set by the store. It's printed on the damn book. Yep. And for the most part, although, you know, Borders used to have stickers on the back of the book, so I can see where some of that impression comes from. I mean, yeah, but even McNally Jackson has stickers printed on the books. Yeah, um, yeah, that's part, true. Or, like, you know, sections and things like that, but the price was on. Right. Anyway, so that's, all of that is a topic for another day, I feel like. <laughs> Pricing. Pricing is always interesting. I'm fascinated by pricing. Yeah. Um. And, and how the larger economic trends work out. But uh, so podcast, you want to talk about, um, what should we call it? Missing Richard Simmons. I, I, well, I should preface this by saying I've always been fascinated by, missing, by Richard Simmons. And um, we talked about the article that was written whenever that was, when the police had gone to his house and TMZ picked up on it and yep. that sort of thing. This is all based on his former masseuse. Yes. going to use that term of all the others. Um, had called the Beverly Hills Police Department and asked them to do a, um, what's it called, a welfare check? Yeah, something to that effect. Where um, an el- they, there was concerns of elder abuse or something. Right. Um, with Richard Simmons being the victim uh, and his live-in maid of God knows how many years being... 40 abused. years now. Yeah. Um, well, she's a witch, remember? That's, the masseuse claims the that she's witch. a literal so, witch. There's that. Anyway, it's a... I, I assume you finished listening to yep. the whole thing? Yeah. Okay. It's amazing, this guy who had gone to uh, Slimmons, which, God, I did not know existed and really wish I had. Yeah. Um, which was Richard Simmons apparently opened a gym in LA way, way, way before he was famous called Slimmons yeah. and kept it open all through the, his heyday in the eighties and nineties. Um, and was still teaching classes until like two years ago. Um, and so this guy had gone, the, the, the producer of the podcast had gone and become friends with him and, and all sorts of stuff. And then Richard just disappeared and, uh, he investigates why, um, it There's no really conclusion. Good. There's not really anything determined one way or the other, except that it's generally believed that Richard is just fine, just wanted to disappear. Is that 
Yeah, I like that? I like I do buy into the the, the it's so yeah. I got a lot of thoughts about this. I do buy into the general idea that Richard Simmons something happened. He then stopped for a second, and and somehow in that stopping was like, I don't have to do this anymore, and just didn't, and like became accustomed to that. And that once that once you start going down that road, you really can't go back. You can't go back and be like, oh, by the way, I'm gonna just you know not be Richard Simmons anymore. I don't want to do this. Like at some point, I think we've gone too far where it's like, it's easier just to cut off all communication. But like the, the fascinating, like the, and that's the real driver of this, of the podcast is like this idea that the, everyone's like, he just like vanished on us and we don't know what's going on or if he's okay. And, but it's like, how does this, how do we, how can we create a narrative that makes sense out of this? Because Richard Simmons was so outgoing and so helpful and such a, like, in so many ways I was impressed by like how much of a good person he seems like through that podcast that he like helped all these people and like, you know, really revolutionized like weight loss and, and exercise in a lot of ways for a lot of people and seemed like he was always helping people and he'd call people and was friendly and then just vanished. And that breaks the narrative. So everything that they knew about him is gone. And now they have to find a new narrative that can explain this in rational ways that make sense to them. And that all these people who are close to him are, are really struggling with that. Cause I think that that, that kind of, creation of a narrative can be tricky it's like with the election like we had one narrative that didn't happen and now everyone had to be like oh well, it's because she didn't go to wisconsin um and you start to like come up with rational explanations to fix your 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 world view and i think that that's what's really interesting about this although i i'm worried that like there's becoming more and more of these podcasts that are like how can i explain this crazy thing this crazy person like the s-town one that's also very popular right now the new serial this american life one uh, I'm, I'm begrudgingly listening to it now. I listened uh, to the whole thing almost right when it came out. Cause I was like, I need to, I just want to know. I I can listen to like a couple hours of stuff throughout the day at the gym and on the way to and from work. So I listened to all of it. It's interesting. Um, but it has a similar feel of like, here's a person that I can't quite, that doesn't fit these categories. How do I create a narrative that like will make them fit into into a, a more understandable thing for the world. And it's not exactly like that. It's not stupid like I'm making it sound. But um, but there is going to be, I, I can already sense that this is going to become one of those trends where like that's the, new, that's the new thing for a little while. And it feels a little narcissistic and a little bit about like how does this narrative affect me rather than being more about the outside world. It's funny. I, one of the, I'm only... I've listened to three episodes of the seven of shit town and um, I'm like only 10 minutes into like the fourth episode or something. And I'm very tempted to take away a certain point from the series so far, which is that our Northern sort of uh, sort of stereotypes for lack of a better term of not the South as like, you know, a massive block but of like the rural sort of white trash south right. um that we sort of think that they're all just bigots and you know whatever racist and all those sorts of things that you know i that you know they they're christians and they're good people and you know they're not all in the ku klux klan but you know down underneath it all they are sort of all racist right like this i'm d- d- horribly generalizing a sort of northern <laughs> Thing, but I do think that that's how a lot of northern people think of oh, yeah. white trash from the south. Not that they're particularly evil or any of these sorts of things. So that's their, they have a different way of life. And I'm tempted to take away that John B., the, the sort of center of the, the thing, and then Tyler, the other character at the center of it, are such good people that it's sort of they stand out as this sort of, you know, hey, hey, don't generalize everyone don't stereotype the south and you know these are just good people who want you know to have the basic decent human you know existence they just want the the same things we all want and yet i feel like that's all going to get undermined at some point in the very near future yep Yep. um it's a little more confusing i in the end i think that it's i think i like that series because i liked the the John B in the end is being like interesting, but there's parts of the production of that that are so, so so NPR and there, and Oh yeah. yeah. 
And yeah. that part drives me a little bit insane. But like you'll I think by the end, I don't want to give anything away because it is one of these things that like as each little unveiling takes place and what you'll find is that there is no overarching narrative, maybe. Um and that that's maybe to the podcast detriment because nothing ever quite comes together. But there is in the last episode you're gonna be like, What the shit? Like that's crazy. Um so I don't want to say anything more. You need to you need to finish it. All right. Um, um, but while we're talking about podcasts uh, in this way, one of the other things you sent me, and I'm not going to, I don't even want to bother talking about it, but it's a narrative, like a story, basically, done as a podcast. And I think we've talked about these before because I've listened to one called, God, I'm not going to remember. Do you remember last year the GE, like the General Electric had one? No. And it was It was about a sound that made people die. Oh, are you talking about the, the, um, um, no, that's not the one I'm thinking of. I don't think I've listened to a few of them. There's one that was like called life something. Oh God. What was it called? There's Can't. a bunch of these. Yeah, but there they are, are. They're, they're essentially life um, after. Yeah. They're, they're just radio plays, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's fine. And they're more, as opposed to narrative nonfiction, which is, I suppose, the two things we began this talking about, these are actual fiction. And um, I think for people like us, they sort of fill this gap where, like, uh, yeah, you can't read and walk for 20 minutes at the same time, or you can't read and, and run on the treadmill at the same time, um, or drive the car at the same time. And so these sort of narrative podcasts sort of are great for when you don't necessarily want to listen to yet another political podcast or another sports <laughs> podcast or, which is my case. Um, yep. <laughs> and these things are nice. They fill in, in these little gaps where you just want something sort of entertaining, but thought provoking and, um, you know, well-produced, I, I would say. And I think it's an interesting trend. I don't, I mean, they're like the antidote to paid, ebook or uh, audiobooks right because they're all going to be free because you get advertisements for squarespace in between blue apron i don't think blue apron could exist without podcasts our podcast couldn't exist without blue apron blue apron squarespace what's the bed mailchimp oh what is it i forget cat no what is it yeah casper yeah. yeah Um, yeah, those, those are your, your four basic sort of things. Um, although I don't know if you've noticed on, uh, how did this get made? They're now doing condoms. Oh, really? No, I haven't listened to the most recent ones. That's that's great. (laughs) (laughs) That's sort of amazing. Which, and they're never going to listen to this in a million years, but maybe one of their producers or something. Anyway, they have, um, because Paul does all the ads, all of them. But Paul is reading the condom one, which to me, I mean, Paul is married to June. Uh, maybe Jason, the single guy, should be doing the condom one. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Feel free to use that information. Although, don't, um, does, doesn't June, don't they have like a couple of kids now? They have one child. It's yeah. just one. I feel like she's been pregnant a few times, but maybe I just listened to them out of order and she's just been pregnant once. Yeah, they have one child. That's that is pretty funny. And this this brings up a different thing, which is this is um, not related necessarily to publishing, but I do think it's interesting because it's part of like the media trends. Is the thing that's going on with the Ringer this month? So the Ringer podcasts are all on tune in or yeah tune in for this month, which is free if you want to listen to those podcasts. I guess they're free via that app, but they are not on iTunes, which I can't make sense of this as a business move. Um, do you have any insight? Cause like the way that I'm reading it is that like, so I, I don't listen to many of the ringer podcasts, but I did listen to the MLB one for a while with Ben Lindbergh, who does effectively wild. Um, and I prefer effectively wild, but the ringer one's fine. And, um, and I can't listen to it this month cause it's on tune in and I'm just not going to do that. And when he was on effectively wild, which he also still hosts, he says like my other podcast is going to tune in for this month. I know that it's more complicated, so we might lose some listeners this month, but hopefully it'll be good for the company. I was like, this is so weird that you took like the number one, so- the place that most people get their podcast from and just removed yourself from that in an attempt to, I don't know what. I mean, TuneIn must be paying them for it, but like to, to hinder your audience? 
Uh, clearly, they're getting money. I mean, that has to be the the only. Is it enough? I don't know. That's that's the question, right? Like, how much could it possibly be? Yeah. Uh, I will say, my friend David's uh, wrestling podcast, which, as you noticed, uh, is in its own feed now, is is still on iTunes. So maybe it's not all of them. I don't think it's all of them. I think it's anything with the word ringer in it is probably. Oh, okay. Right. So like Bill Simmons. Um, and then like, isn't it just called like the ringer football podcast and things like that? I don't know. And yeah, I think you're probably right. Cause it's like the ringer MLB podcast, the ringer right. NBA podcast. But I mean, who knows, but yeah, they must be paying them an, an ungodly amount of money. Um, and hoping that people will subscribe to tune in. Which is expensive. I have no idea how much it is, but I think it was like ninety nine dollars a year. Oh Jesus Christ. No. Yeah, no, that's that's a lot of money. Yeah. For podcasts that are free elsewhere? Like why would you do that? I, I guess think- well tune in if you subscribe, you also get like uh the feed for like MLB all MLB games or all NFL games and oh, okay. soccer. You get other things that you that you would have to pay for in other places. Sure. But what does the ringer of being on there? add to your tune in experience is it just that it's all in the same place all of a sudden i don't know i just this is why i'm super baffled by it because it just seems like a weird move i'm sure i could ask my friend david but then i would not be able to share that information right (laughs) or with you maybe but not the not not our listeners i I also (laughs) was thinking like i'll bet you if you go to the ringer they probably explain all of this um but i (laughs) would never do that let us see. Um, and I can't. And so, I, so I did, but I can't find it on here. But there's another thing that's related to this that's also business. And so one thing is the ringer is presented by Miller Light of all, all things. So Miller Light and Tune In are like, this is so weird. And that the ringer was one of those that went to Medium, um, the 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 yeah. platform, and Medium is basically closing. Um, for for lack of a better, well, that's like a nuanced way of putting it. But they're supposed to like switch to a subscription model because ads don't work, and their whole idea is bullshit, and nothing f- worked the way that they wanted it to. And that's that's pretty tragic for like Electric Lit and The Ringer and these places that were like, well, we're going all in on medium, and that apparently didn't work. Yeah. Um, did anyone not see this coming? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that they didn't i guess um the the last thing we're going to talk about is i got an email from uh joanna walsh today who is a, a writer a critic um she's she's i think she's the instrumental person behind the hashtag read women and the read women like um uh like the twitter feed whatever you call it twitter uh handle um although i might be might be overstating how much she started it but she has a new book that's called seed that was designed and written for the web environment or for like reading on your phone. So like when you go to it, it's called seed story.com. It opens up to a thing where you have to tap to get to like the page and then you have to swipe to read a little bit. And then as you read it, there's like a bunch of different options that you can use that you tap on different parts to get to the book. And the way the thing that I'm going to read about this, this is her description of it. Um, a nonlinear. So it's best read on phone or a tablet, an experimental digital novella, that's created in collaboration with Visual Editions Editions at Play. A nonlinear narrative inspired by Cortazar's Hopscotch, Prex Life of User's Manual, Bellastrini's Tristano, the work of Kathy Acker, B.S. Johnson, and Quinn, and other experimental writers, Seed takes structural play into the digital realm. It tells the story of a girl on the brink of adulthood at the tail end of the 1980s. Haunted by ideas of infection, AIDS, Chernobyl, and CJD, Seed's narrator is vulnerable to and brutalized by her environment. With few words to describe her situation, she is, like Shakespeare's Ophelia, incapable of her own distress, but is also capable of moments of intense joy and love. Now, I remember a lot of, like, back in the day, like in the 90s, when, like, uh, hypertexts were going to be, like, the future of all all writing and all that, that there was, like, a there's uh, Shelley Jackson wrote one of these sort of books that's called The Patchwork Girl, I believe, and there's um, someone named Michael Joyce that wrote a bunch of them, and they were all, like, sort of experiments with this as a form, and I feel like it sort of went away for a long time, or was, like, underground and it's interesting that this is back in this way because that description sounds cool like i would read that book probably um and i've clicked on this but i haven't really read any part of it i just got this today and sent it to you immediately uh yeah i mean the the problem 
for me, and I think probably for you as well, is I'm not going to do this on my phone. <laughs> uh, I like, like you said, like if she were to write that book, I would read that book. Right. Even if it were sort of experimental and I don't know, do, do the naked lunch thing to it or something. I don't know. But instead it sounds like choose your own adventure on an iPhone. Even yeah. if she's a good writer, it's still fundamentally like I'm going to borrow Marshall McLuhan here. Like the medium is the message here. I'm sorry. It really is. Um, and that's unfortunate. I don't want her to get sort of swallowed up by that sort of um, project. Yeah, it's interesting too. Like this is one of those situations that go back to the money talk of earlier. How is this sustainable? Oh, it can't be. No way. I mean, they're not going to make, are they charging for the app or no. something? No, no. To the best of my knowledge, they're not. Maybe someone funded it. Yeah, I mean, it has to be somebody's like they wanted to see if this is if it would be fun, if people would enjoy it. You know, um, it's like an art installation or whatever. I get it. Um, it's not necessarily something you can own um, later on down the line, but it's worth doing nonetheless. It's just I'm such a luddite that I just I'm not I'm not gonna, this is not a thing that I'm going to participate in, unfortunately. Yeah, it is pretty. If anyone if anyone is game for it, it's and also when you click on things, it starts to show you different pathways. Not that yeah. you have options, but like if you were to follow the lines, you would move to different sections and there's a bunch of different lines that seem to coalesce. I haven't obviously have not given this enough time to like understand how it all works. I mean, the video is only a minute long, so you're not really getting into it, but it is. Oh, I didn't watch the video. I just went straight to the book. Oh, uh, there's a little bit of, you know, choose your own adventure. There's a little bit of um, video game aspect to it, really. Um you know, uh, it, it is what it is. I, I just, I like what she does. I like her books, but this is not something I'm going to be participating in. Yeah. Fair I, enough. I, I, I will be okay with that. You, uh, do you want to talk about your new uh, podcast? Uh, no, let's do it in a couple of weeks. Okay. There's, there's a new thing because I need to record one of them first, but they're gonna, there's going to be, there's going to be news. There will be news in the future. All right. And I think it'll be interesting, but I want to nail one more thing down. We started announcing it a little bit, though. Okay. Um, other than that, we will definitely have the short list, which, uh, you know, I am moderating, so I know uh, what it is. Um, <laughs> a pretty good idea what it is. Um, I, I assume my, my percentages that I've been posting on every one of the write-ups are, are 100% accurate. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see George uh, Carroll wrote one for Shelf Awareness yesterday? Yes. Or whatever, a couple days ago? Um, I, I read was, that before he, before he sent it in. I, uh, I, I, I read a version of it before he sent it in. Um, and he sort of inspired me to do my percentage one because it's like, this would be fun. And, uh, but he had like real odds as if it were like a racetrack. I don't understand how odds work really like that. Like, and I don't think <laughs> percentages seem like a little bit easier to cheat. I will. The odds, it's very simple. If you bet $1, you win the dollar. Oh, no, the I know that. But there was right. one time I did that for our shortlist um, for the 10 books and, and which would win. And a guy came up to me at the party where it was announced and said that as a combined total, I hadn't done it correctly. That, oh, that. As, that as a, as because it was like a fixed system, right? Because there's one winner out of that. That somehow, like it should, there's certain ways that could tally up that would be accurate. That you would, you know, you would make, you would win, um, and that it would all balance out somehow, according to general overall principles of of game theory and betting. And I was just like, holy shit, I have no idea what any of that any of that means. But I can give random percentages of things. I didn't realize that they were supposed to add up to something. He was he he was basically presenting it like if you were the if you were the betting house. I don't know. I don't know. But it made well, yeah. me feel like I really didn't know what I was doing. Like, yeah, they try to cover their asses no matter what the outcome. Yeah. Right? I get that. But um, but it still should have. I, who knows? Um, yeah. But anyways, yeah. So I just did it as percentages, which are uh, clearly not even close to right. We shall see. Uh, okay. <laughs> True. We'll see again. But I don't know. Do you have any rants or raves? Uh, no, I don't have any. I or feel like I ranted about people not being paid quite enough so <laughs> or books that you want to recommend 
or books that you're reading <laughs> that you want to recommend or new ones? I'm reading Underground uh, Airlines finally. Oh, how is it? It's really good. It's really good. I read his three earlier books. Oh, I listened to the audiobooks of his three earlier books, and they were entertaining. Like Last Policeman, yep. that whole thing? Yeah, that I whole trilogy. bought that and plan on reading that soon as well. It's I'm having a hard time reading most fiction these days, partly because of my anxiety about work and all that sort of thing. Uh, um, you know, about getting the bookstore and everything. Um, so I, I give up on things very quickly, none of which I'm going to mention because I don't want to slander any books that I perhaps should have given a better chance to, but uh, I, I, really caught me. I have two comments that might be of interest to our readers. One is that in the book that we used in our class this week was uh, Sasha Sokolov's Between Dog and Wolf which was translated by Alexander Bogoslowski um, and published by Columbia as part of their Russian library thing, which uh, Overlook was going to do way back when, and then that didn't happen, and now it's with Columbia. Um, Alexander Bogolowski also translated School for Fools by the same author for New York Review of Books, and he's translated both of those books into Polish. He first translated them from Russian into Polish and then translated them from Russian into English, which I have not heard of before of anyone doing that, especially with books that are like rather experimental and weird um, and complicated. I, I, that sort of surprised me. I, can you think of any example like that? No, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Never. Yeah. I couldn't, there's nothing, but then the the book that I would recommend was that it's so much work. It took him 10 years to do the between dog and wolf from Russian into Polish alone. So, Yeah, so this is like his life project, essentially, of translating this one author. He's done three books by him, but two of them he's done twice. <laughs> Can you, I can't even begin to... I just, it just blows my mind. But I would highly recommend, and people are probably on this a little bit already, but um, Jung Young Moon um, is an author that's published by both Delkey. He's a Korean author published by both Delkey and um, Deep Vellum. And I'm using the Deep Vellum book in my class, and... To prepare, I wanted to read the Delkey one, one of the Delkey ones, A Contrived World, that's a novel. This book is hysterical and fantastic. This might be my new favorite Korean book. I think it is. I'm going to put some quotes online just because I want to put some quotes online from it. Um, And I don't really want to read them here because they're longer. But uh, it's so funny. I think you would actually like this book because it's kind of of a mix between like, um, maybe like a little Bukowski guess, but like, or uh, Beckett where this guy's just like, living a life and just having crazy observations and things just go along and it's super entertaining. The part that one of the parts I want to quote is this whole long paragraph. That's basically like, before I tell you about the things I like, I want to tell you about all the things I don't like. And then it's just like a litany of things that he just doesn't consider fun. A list of things I do not consider fun. That's cool. I abide by something like that. <laughs> it's super. It's great. Like I was reading it last night and just absolutely adored it. So. Uh, I'm looking at the page for uh, Between Dog and Wolf and thinking I might be interested in this book, but oh my god, no. You're not going to like it. Not not my kind of book. Nope. Which is a shame because the title is so great. Well, we use this and then we use uh, Last Wolf and Herman next week. Well, those are, those are both good too. Although, on two separate books, novellas. Uh, uh, I should probably uh, say that I read your book, um, not, not your personal book, but an open letter book, uh, Bardo or Not Bardo. Oh, yeah. And God damn, is he just fantastic. And we've talked about him before. Like, not all of his books work for me because they are they, the, that insular sort of um, universe that he creates. I find a little impenetrable, but this one was really, really good. He's so smart. Yeah, but you have Radiant Terminus too. That one people have have responded well to as well. I like, seem to really like that. Yeah, I really like the the. He's got that ability to like these sentences go on, and you're not quite sure how important a sentence is in the grand scheme of things, and then he just sort of drops something in there at the very end, and you're like, "Oh God, that was amazing!" <laughs> yeah, and then it just they pile up very rapidly, and and yeah, no, I think he's brilliant. Very good. So I have a I have a question or a comment on that really quick since um since you mentioned it. This is a finalist for the or I don't know what they're calling it. I guess they're calling it a finalist um for the first round of the Albertine Prize, which is a new prize honoring French books translated into English from the past year. It's one of yep. ten books that are listed on here. And this is a prize in which it's open, it's decided by reader voting. So people yep. can go on and vote for the 
I, I think you can vote for more than one book or something like that. But, um, but yes, you can, can. What's that? I think you can, yes. I think See. you can too, but I'm not sure if it's like, oh yeah, it says if you sign in, you can vote for as many as you want. Um, so anyone who's listening, go on and vote for Bardo. The finalists, the final three books will be announced on April 14th, and there will be a new round of voting after that through the end of April. But um, it would be super cool if this book made it to the three to the final three. So listen, who, who cares if you read it or not? Trust Tom. He has a quote about it that we included in our newsletter. And you should just go vote for it just blindly. Um, yes, in theory. Uh, so, yes, the, the people at the French book department asked me to they knew I was a fan and said, hey, would you write something for it? And if uh, it becomes one of the final three, I'll go and um, argue on its behalf at an, at a, at an event. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that that's how that was going to work. Yeah. Maybe that's not public yet, but who really cares? So, yeah, they're going to have um, like a public sort of discussion slash debate uh, for the three finalists at some point um, before voting for the final winner uh, closes. So presumably somewhere between the 14th and 30th. Nice. So, Very nice. So, I would love to come and do that. That'd be super cool. Um, uh, we're not even going to bother listing the other books here. Just go and just, vote for yeah, it's albertine.com slash albertine hyphen prize. You'll find it right away. Yes. Anyways, I've got nothing else to add. This is sort of a long one. But in, if you're listening still, send us comments and questions and rate us on iTunes. Yes. And follow um, the Best Translated Book Award on Twitter and look for the awards, uh, the shortlist on the 18th. 18th. Uh, and the winner in May. May 4th. Uh, May 4th. There you go. Uh, it'll be fun. I'm, I'm curious to see how this, who wins this year. It is, it's, it's an interesting list. Um, yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, nice to see. Okay, well, I will talk to you later. And we'll be back in a week or so. All right. Thank you. Thank you.